Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to talk about atomic structure and chemical formulae and how we can put chemical formulas together to be able to explain certain things. And we will look at the structure of the atom to get an idea of exactly a little bit better idea of how we want to consider an atom and how it works. So we're starting off with atomic structure and we looked previously that an atom consists of a very tiny nucleus surrounded by electrons. Now note that this is not even close to being to scale as there should be five orders of magnitude between the size of the nucleus and the size of the electron cloud. That would be 10 to the fifth power or 100,000 times. So the nucleus would be 100,000 times smaller than the electron cloud. So we're not even close to putting this to scale. Now we do want to look at the uh, idea of nucleus. If the nucleus were the size of a blueberry, to try to put this into perspective, then the entire atom would be the size of a football field. So if you put a blueberry at the center of the football field here, then the entire atom would survive this surround this entire entire area. And that whole area in between would be empty. There would be nothing there. You have the nucleus and a lot of empty space, except for those few electrons scattered around. And while we do this, we do want to look make up a couple of new units to look at. And those are we need the fundamental unit of charge, which is E the charge on an electron. And we want to look at the atomic mass unit, the average mass of one nucleon, which is one particle in the nucleus of an atom. And we can summarize those a little bit here. Because we are going to be dealing with such small numbers, the electric charge is very small number of coulombs 10 to the minus 19th. So the unit charge is then negative one for an electron, positive one for a proton and zero for a neutron. The mass Again, the masses here given in grams and 10 to the minus 24th power again are very tiny. So we use atomic mass units. The neutron has an atomic mass unit given here 1.00866. The proton slightly less 1.00727 and the electron a very small mass of 0.00055. So these still are numbers that we can deal with a lot easier than the very tiny numbers for charge and mass that we have. Now we can um, look a little bit more about what we mean with things like the atomic number. Now the atomic number is given by the letter Z and this is what defines the atom. This is the number of protons in the nucleus that tells us what kind of atom it is. So an, an atom with one proton is hydrogen one with two is helium. Nothing else matters. This tells us what the atom is. The mass number given by a is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So this relates us to the mass. Remember that protons and neutrons make up the vast majority of the mass. The electrons were very small mass by comparison. The other thing that we look at is the atomic charge. The atomic charge is the number of protons positive charges minus the number of electrons which are negatively charged. So if we have more protons than electrons, then we would have a positively charged and a positive atomic charge. If we have more electrons than protons, we would have a negative atomic charge. And that normally most atoms are going to be neutral for most uh, atoms, we will have the number of protons being equal to the number of electrons. But if they are not equal, then the atom is electrically charged and we call that an ion that it that one electron or more electrons have been added or subtracted from it. And we can use specific terms that if it is as electrons added, it is an anion which is negatively charged. And if it has electrons removed, then it is a cation, which is positively charged.
Now we can look at an example of what we how we can cal figure this out for a specific atom. And let's take the example of iodine. Iodine atoms are added to a salt are anions with a negative one charge and a mass number of 127. And we want to know how many protons, how many neutrons, and how many electrons would there be in one of these iodine anions. So we know enough to be able to figure all of this out. Let's look at each in turn. Iodine, we can look up the atomic number, which is 53. That tells us how many protons are there. So that's the first step. And then we know we can figure out the mass number because we figure out they given the mass number of 127. We know how many protons are there. So the difference between these two will give us the number of neutrons at 74. 127 the total mass number minus the number of protons at 53 will give us 74. So now we just need to figure out the number of electrons. Well, if this were neutral, this would be very easy because then the number of protons would be the same as the number of electrons. But we have a minus one charge here. So because we have that, we have one extra electron. So instead of the 53 that would match the number of protons, we need one extra, which means we have 54 electrons. And then that gives us our total answers here which means we have 53 protons, 74 neutrons, and 54 electrons in this iodine anion. So that's one example of how we can go about calculating the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons given a little bit of information about the material. Now, we also have a chemical symbol for each of these. And each element has its own chemical symbol, generally a one to three letter abbreviation for an element. Of these, only the first letter is capitalized. And we see some examples here for things like aluminum, or AL, bromine, BR, and uh, uh, calcium, CA, and so on. You'll note that some don't really match up with the element. So while a lot of them do, there are a few things like gold, which has AU, which seems like it has nothing to do with gold, or sodium, which is NA, and several others you see, they actually come from the Latin names for the and Latin names for them. So the Latin names for uh, gold is aurum, and that is where the AU comes from. So there are some that match up very easily, things like nitrogen and oxygen very easily have things. Others we have to think about because they come from the Greek names for those elements. Alrighty, and then we can look at uh, isotopes, the uh, concept of isotopes. Isotopes are atoms that have different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. So for example, magnesium has isotopes with mass numbers of 24, 25 and 26. Now we can write these in several different ways. We sometimes write them as the with a superscript before the element. So 24 magnesium, 25 mg, or 26 mg. Or we write them with the element name and then the number after it. So magnesium 24 and so often abbreviated as mg using the uh, terminology there and then magnesium 24, so it would be Mg24 or 25 or 26, depending on which isotope we are considering. And we can use that as a way to write these elements. We put the mass number to the upper left, to the upper right is the charge, and to the lower left is the atomic number. Now the atomic number is often emitted because helium tells us knowing the element here in the middle that kind of tells us what the element is going to be. So helium has an atomic number of two. These two are always the same. But these can vary depending on what the isotope is and what the ionic charge happens to be. So we can do the same thing with magnesium. Magnesium has atomic number 12. In this case we're looking at magnesium 24 and it has a plus two charge, meaning it has lost two electrons. 
Now the atomic masses if you note those as we look at them they're not exactly whole numbers. And that's because there are different isotopes. The atomic mass that we give is the average mass of that of those isotopes. So in the case of boron here we have boron 10 and boron 11. Boron 10 makes up a little bit less than 20% of the atoms. Boron 11 makes up a little over 80%. Uh, boron 10 is a little over 10 atomic mass units. Boron 11 a little over 11. So instead of having atomic mass of 10 or 11, we weight those together by their fractions. So 19.9% is 0.199. And we multiply that times the uh, that atomic mass. And 80.1% is 0 0.801. We multiply that by the other atomic mass. Well, the first part here comes out to 1.99, the second part to 8.82. And when we add these two together, we get 10.81. That is the average atomic mass. So you note that it's in between these two and that it's closer to the one that has the higher percentage. If they were equal percentages, it would be close to the middle. So that's one way we can do calculate the atomic mass of a given element. Now we want to look at chemical formulae as well. And there's different types of formulae. Uh, we have first of all, a molecular formula, which is something like this for methane CH4 tells us the number of each type of atom that exists. So one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. But it doesn't give us any more information. It tells us just that basic information. We also can use a structural formula. And a structural formula such as B here shows a little bit more about how it's put together. So we have a carbon atom connected to four individual hydrogen atoms. So it gives us a little bit better idea of the structure, but it's still not quite a three dimensional. If we want a three dimensional model, we look at things like the ball and stick and space filling models. So ball and stick shows a little bit better and here we can see in three dimensions that you have the different bonds going out in different directions in sort of a tetrahedral form. So it is uh, you get a little bit better of the three dimensional and the space filling just kind of puts this all together without the lines in between just kind of puts the blobs at the end of each of each of the atoms. Now we can also look at this for other uh, compounds. In this case, we're looking at a sulfur molecule. And sulfur molecule, we can see it here as a ring of material. So this is eight sulfur atoms. Uh, you could also write it as S8. And here, but here, this makes it look two dimensional. When we look at it in three dimensions, we see that there's some interesting structure to the way these bond and they actually bond in three dimensions a little bit differently than we might expect. So we can see them, we can use different types of models and we'll use some of these in different ways as we work through this section. Now molecules, we want to qualify when we put a subscript or a number in front of a symbol, these tell us two completely different things. The subscripts tell us the number of atoms bonded together. So this actually tells us about bonds, things that are connected. The number in front is a count, how many of those molecules or atoms we have. So if we have one lone hydrogen atom, that is just written as H. Two hydrogen atoms unconnected to each other would be 2H. One hydrogen molecule where, the, where they are bound together is then H2. So note the difference between these. The two in front tells us we have two atoms. The two subscript means that there are two atoms, but they are bonded together. And if we write 2H2, we have two hydrogen molecules. We now have hydrogen molecules bonded together here and here, and we have two of them. So the two out fronts tells us that there's two molecules. The subscript here says that each of those has the two hydrogen atoms bound together. 
And we also want to look at the concept of an empirical formula. An empirical formula includes information on the types of atoms and the simplest whole number ratio of the number of atoms in a compound. So TiO2 would be one example. Now this is different an empirical formula doesn't mean there could be all sorts of other amounts in the compound so there may be more and more bound together. It could be lots of titanium and lots of oxygen not necessarily individual molecules you could have far more bound together. A molecular formula tells us specifically what a molecule looks like and what it has. And in this case, acetic acid has C2H4O2, so two carbons, four hydrogens, and two oxygens. That is one molecule of acetic acid. But that doesn't mean that that is the struct that is not the empirical form of that same equation. And in fact, if we want to look at this, uh, we can look at a molecular form of C2H4O2. And here we can see kind of how that is bonded together. Two carbon atoms here, one oxygen atom here, one here, and then four hydrogen atoms around here. Three of them bonded to carbon and one of them to oxygen. So the molecular form tells us what this looks like. The empirical is the simplified form of this. So it is in the lowest whole number ratio. Since these are all divisible by two, we can divide them by two. And this becomes just C, C1. We don't put the one as a subscript. H4, cut that in half. It becomes H2. And O2 becomes O. So this would be the empirical formula for the same compound for acetic acid as that is in the lowest whole number ratios. Now let's again look at another example here. Uh, we want to look at another example and that would be glucose. So glucose contains six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms and six oxygen atoms. And we want to look for the molecular and empirical formulae for this. So how do we find that? Well, let's look at what we know. The molecular formula is something we'll have to find. And we can find that the molecular formula is given because we have the number of atoms here. So C6 tells us there are six carbons. H12 tells us there are 12 hydrogens. And 6O tells us there are six oxygen atoms. So we just read that from the information we're given. We're given the actual structure of the molecule right here. However, that is not in simplest form because we can look and the ratio is one to two, two to one. So there are, in other words, there are equal numbers of carbon and oxygen atoms, and there are twice as many hydrogen atoms. So once we find those ratios, then we can write the empirical formula of CH2O. Now, if that looks familiar, we saw that not that long ago uh, for the pre in the previous example. So empirical formula could refer to multiple types of uh, multiple types of compounds. So there could be multiple compounds with the same empirical formula as we look at here. Uh, it is the molecular formula will be different, but you call we had C2H4O2, which reduces to exactly the same empirical formula. So this tells us the simplest whole number ratios, but it does not necessarily tell us about the structure of the atom, how many of each molecule there are. It could be some multiple of that. Now, the last thing I want to look at here and talk about briefly are isomers. Isomers are uh, compounds that have the same chemical formulae. So in this case, we have C2H4O2, but they have different structures. So the chemical structures are different. If you note here in acetic acid, you have two carbon atoms are bound together in the center. And one of those carbon atoms has two oxygens combined to uh, bonded to it. And one of those oxygen has a hydrogen atom. Well, methyl formate has exactly the same atoms. It is also C2H4O2. 
But in this case, the carbon atoms are not bound together. There is an oxygen atom in between them and one bound to this uh, carbon atom. And the hydrogen, instead of being bonded to an oxygen atom, is separate and bonded to the carbon, whereas these three, this part looks pretty much the same. So it's kind of a switch as to whether the two carbon atoms are bonded together or the carbon and the oxygen atoms are. But they give you two completely different compounds. So they have the same uh, chemical formula, but they have completely different structures. So let's go ahead and finish up here with our summary. And what we looked at, we talked about atoms and they can be described with their atomic number, mass number and atomic charge. And the atomic number is the number of protons, which tells us what type of atom it is. We looked at molecular formulae that we can use to identify specific elements, differentiate between isotopes. But we had a structural formula that told us how atoms are bonded together. And we looked at empirical formulae, which were different from the molecular because they're reduced to the simplest whole number ratio. So these could have you could have multiple uh, compounds that have the same molecular uh, sorry the same empirical formula but different molecular formulae. So that concludes this lecture on atomic structure and chemical formulae. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then have a great day everyone and I will see you in class.